Welcome to the Writers Guild of Great Britain's YouTube channel and to one of our recorded events. WGGB is a trade union for writers across the board. These events have brought together writers during the pandemic and beyond. The union is its members, so if you're not yet a member, do join us and the link is below. The WGGB is so proud to partner this year with Creative Essentials to bring you a screen adaptation series. Enjoy the event. Um. Uh, hello, everybody, um, and welcome to this Q&A. Uh, as Nadine says, part of a series to accompany the Creative Essentials book, uh, The Art of Screen Adaptation, Top Writers Reveal Their Craft. Um, I'm Alistair Owen, I'm the author of the book, uh, and I'm delighted to be joined by another of the writers from the book, uh, Deborah Mogark. Uh, Debbie, welcome. Thank you, thank you. So in the book, we focused on Debbie's film and TV adaptations of Pride and Prejudice and The Diary of Anne Frank. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, adaptations of her own books uh, by herself and others. Um, we're going to chat for about 30 minutes, uh, then we'll open it up to questions about any of Debbie's screenwriting work, which you can ask, as Nadine said, uh, via the chat function. Um, I'll be monitoring uh, any questions there um, during the interview, as well as consulting my notes here in front of me. So if I'm looking down or off to the side at any point, um, it's not because I've lost interest in what Debbie is saying. Um, so my first question, Debbie, is quite simply, do you prefer adapting your own books or other people's? Well, it, it is the most interesting question actually, because there is a school of thought that thinks that novelists shouldn't adapt their own work because a they don't know how to do it it's a very different technique very different um and that they might be too precious to change it you know they might think that their novel is so perfect that they don't want to change it and they might not have the the sort of screenwriters um adaptability so to speak and um and the other school of thought which I rather adhere to, um, is that once you've written a novel, you know the characters so well, because you've lived with them for so long, that actually when you put them into the dramatic context, when they go through the sea change of becoming creatures of drama of the screen, you can make them do quite interesting things, partly because you, you, you know, you're bored with the book, you've written the blooming book, um, you know it only too well, so you'd rather, you know, push it off maybe in more, go in more bold directions, but more interestingly, because they can then do things which are more profound and more surprising and more truthful to how people are, because they can behave more like real rounded people than say you're presented with a character from Jane Austen um, or from um, some novel who you'll only know just as much as other people know them, as a normal reader will know them, just from the page. So I mean, I'm not explaining it very well, but it just means that sometimes you can take more liberties with a character and make them more interesting, and partly to amuse yourself as much as anyone else. So overall, probably adapting your own work is slightly more enjoyable. It is. I mean, the, the awful thing is when you adapt it and you find that actually when you go through it again and when you set in motion this the, the rather different um, activities that are going to go on but it will be the same sort of framework it'll be like the house is still there but you may knock through the walls in a few rooms and change things but the structure is there you may actually find that when you tackle it again and it may be several years after you've written the novel that actually you've solved some problems that were in the novel and you've made for instance a much better ending um, which you're dying then to put back into the book. Um, so so it's, it's, it's a very complicated thing. And even talking about it makes me feel quite sort of slightly queasy, a little bit nauseous, because when you're doing it, you, you're very split because you've got, you've got the hologram lying over your work that you know so well of the new, of, of you know, the, the new interpretation of it. Um, so you, you, you've got both the stories, you, you've got these two parallel stories. And it's, it's, it's quite odd, it makes me feel just funny talking about it, but, but that's what we're talking about, so let's feel funny. <laughs> um, I remember when The Night Manager was um, uh, televised, uh, obviously John Le Carre didn't uh, adapt that himself, but um, he 
was so taken with the notion of the the, the male uh, intelligence lead from the book uh, being played by a woman, Olivia Coleman, that he actually wished that he had that idea when he'd written it. So you you pr probably are kind of identified with that. You may have had that experience. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and the thing is that, that once you've got your um, screenwriting hat on, you are a rather different sort of writer. And so what you are doing when you go back to this, this text is, is, as I said, changing it. The sea change will happen as draft after draft you, you, you write. But you will, you will see things that maybe, as I said, that, that, that you should have done first time round. And that's slightly frustrating. Have you ever had that experience when someone else is adapting one of your books, where you've seen something they've done and thought, oh, that's good, I, I kind of wish I'd done that, or only when you're doing it yourself? Yes, oh, no, uh, no I have. Um, um, for instance, yes, um, the, the Best Exotic Marigold Hotel that, 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 that I wrote um, a screenplay of, but then Old Parker came and, and rewrote that and changed it anyway, he did it, he did it you know, page one rewrite. Um, there was a very nice bit at the end where the Penelope Wilton character in it, who was a, um, a very smug and snobby woman, um, and we didn't really like her at all. Um, she had a sort of sea change at the end and she um, realized that she'd been a sort of, she'd been a cow and she sort of apologized. And it was very cathartic. It was rather, rather a nice way of ending it. I can't remember what my ending was now in the book, but, um, you know, other things, when other people adapt your work, it, it could be quite painful because it's as if you're out of the house. This is back to house analogies. I'm, I'm, I'm a great metaphor and simile person. It gets rather annoying after a bit, but you'll have to bear with it. Um, it's like you're out of your house and somebody has, has broken in and they're rifling through your underwear drawer and they're going through all your most intimate things and you're powerless because you're not there. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's quite, if it's you know, Tom Stoppard or something, you don't mind so much, but, but it just, I did find, I, I have found my own stuff when it's adapted by other people, it's quite painful. But sometimes, as I said, they might have an idea which actually um, improves the plot or changes it in a way which I hadn't thought to do at the time. Because when you're writing a novel, those of you who write novels as well as, as, as screenplays in our chat room, um, it's such a hugely complicated business. It's such an extraordinary complicated business that it's very easy to not see um, the wood for the trees because you, you, you can, uh, your, your head's down, you're, you're not sort of standing back enough sometimes, you're working out puzzles and difficulties and all sorts of things, and you may not see something very obvious that somebody is jealous of somebody else's wife, you know, or something fairly obvious. And if somebody else comes along and adapts it, they, they might, you know, realise that. Or if you're adapting your own stuff, if you have a good script meeting, and those of you who, who have had script meetings will know that a good script meeting can be a wondrous thing because you're all tussling with these characters and you're saying, well, why is she jealous of her or whatever? So in a good script meeting, your, um, uh, your director and the producer and the, the script editor and things will ask questions or suggest things which may make you realise something which might be sort of pretty obvious but you hadn't noticed when you're in the thick of this extraordinary complex and involving um, and difficult process of writing a novel so it can draw you back to first principles sometimes which is very useful. Your first screen credit was in 1986 uh, on To Have and To Hold an eight-part tv series which was published as a novel the same year um, which came first the book or the script or were you writing them simultaneously? Well, do you know, it, that, it, that is a terrible title, isn't it, to have and to hold? I was, that was an ITV-initiated um, title. Um, no, I had the idea for, for it as a script because um, this was before surrogate motherhood was a twinkle in anybody's eye, wasn't it? wasn't a common subject at all. And um, I, had, I have a sister who can't have children, I can have children, and um, I decided I would have a baby for her because her 
boyfriend at the time was a friend of mine and I thought I'd get pregnant by him. I was married, had children, have, have a baby. What's not to like? And then, of course, the minute I sat and thought about it, I thought this is a total can of worms. And can you imagine all the things that can go wrong if you have a baby for your sister? And also, I thought this falls naturally into episodes. I mean, A, it's very commercial. I thought ITV straight away. Um, it's very commercial because you, you've got the end of episode one, she suggests this plan, right? The end of episode two, she is supposed to be, you know, doing it with a turkey baster, but actually she gets drunk and goes to bed with the, the friend of her husband, who's the, the boyfriend of her sister. Um, in episode three, end of episode three, the husband finds out all hell breaks loose, but yet it's a complicated situation because it's sort of sanctioned adultery. She's, she's committing adultery, but it's for the good of her sister. She's going to give her sister this extraordinary gift. You know, episode, end of episode four, uh, she becomes pregnant or whatever. End of episode five, um, maybe she has the baby and then wants to keep it. You know, you, you can imagine it, it, it falls naturally into big, fat commercial. Well, let's not say commercial. Let's say strong emotional high concept episodes and so in those days god it was so it was so easy i went to the head of itv a chap called nick elliott who some of you may have heard of he's now long retired and um i i knew him many i think I'd, I'd done a little something i'd done a crown court for him or something anyway um but i hadn't done anything big at all and i went to him and i pitched it and he said okay go ahead and write it can you imagine how lovely that was? Um, and he wanted eight episodes rather than six because it was cheaper, obviously, to do eight, shoot eight um, once you got all the actors and the sets and things. So it was very cheap to shoot because a lot of it took place in two households, the two sisters' households. Um, and a lot of it took place in bed. Um, so you just had the, you know, the back bit of the bed and everything was dead cheap. And we had a lovely cast with Amanda Redman and Brian Prother and things and Eamon Bolam and Marion Bailey. Um, and we, it was, it was fantastic fun, but I had to, I had to lengthen it because of it being eight episodes. I had to weave another plot in. And so I wove a pretty unconvincing plot. Um, which was to do with the fact that their father of these two sisters, who were based on me and my other, my sister, um, wasn't their real father, I think, or something. It was a bit, it was a bit, it was a bit cheesy, to tell the truth. And it didn't really mesh with that. And it seemed a bit, you know, obvious, obvious uh, parallels. And, and it, but it, it didn't quite fit. And yet it also looked like obvious parallels, you know, both things which weren't that great. But I mean, I don't think anyone noticed because I don't think anyone particularly watched those, those bits. They watched it for the um, emotional stuff between the two couples, the sisters and their, then the husband and boyfriend. You effectively novelised your own script when you came down well, to it. Exactly. So what happened was I then, so I wrote the scripts and it was, it was a great adventure. I hadn't had much experience in writing for television. I mean, talk about taking a punt. You know, nowadays this wouldn't happen. Um, so they took a punt with me, basically, because it was a high concept thing. And so I then novelized it pretty fast because it was coming out on television. And the book, I haven't reread the book. I'm slightly ashamed of it because I it, it was it, it was a sort of novelization. And I think that I, you know, I bulked out the bits between the dialogue, but a lot of the dialogue I took from the telly thing because I didn't really have time. Um, I had to make them make some money because I had little children and I was don't know what was happening, but probably divorcing my first husband or something. And um, so, uh, it, so it was really a novelization. And I hadn't I hadn't really done it that way around before. I'd written several novels by then, but I'd written the novels alone without a TV actor in my head. Um, you know, by the time I was novelizing it, my imaginary people from the screenplay had become Amanda Redmond, Brian Frothel, um, Marion Bailey and uh, Eamon Bolan. So I had them also in my head on top of my imaginary people. Um, so that was a bit muddling because they had done different things with their parts than, than I had expected because they're actors, you know, they, they'd done wonderful things. Um, so 
it was quite complicated to do and i don't think it was uh, i don't think it was my one of it's not a novel that i've reread and it's got this ghastly cheesy title anyway so um but anyway it it it, it happened i'm loving how honest you are about your <laughs> <laughs> comparatively unusual actually um You've touched on something quite interesting there, which I was going to ask about anyway, and that is to do with the, the length of TV series, particularly in relation to adaptations. Um, so you subsequently adapted, um, or have subsequently adapted five more of your own novels, um, Stolen in 1990, Seesaw and Close Relations in 98, Final Demand in 2003, and Tulip Fever, and we'll come back to Tom Stoppard's metaphorical rifling of your underwear drawer soon. Um, Final Demand was a single drama, but the others were six, three and five part series respectively. So the question is, what determines the number of episodes in a TV drama? Is that a creative or a commercial decision or both? Or has that changed over time? Well, the thing is, it's not your decision. It's not really the writer's decision, because as everyone knows who, who, who writes scripts, they change constantly according to the fashion. So if there's been a huge hit series, um, that is in half hours, for instance, which became the fashion of you know a year or so ago. Um, I mean the flea baggy sort of time. Then everyone wants half hours, and then but it, and and of course it affects subject matter as well because we all feel that there's been too many, you know, dead girls in in woods and battered wives um, living in immaculate homes with beautiful slate kitchens. Um, so things go in fashions and so, uh, but, but as far as, as, as structure goes, I'm constantly, I was constantly being asked to change it. Could, could you redo it as um, two 90 minutes? We, we had that for a while. Um, Cause I, I tried for a long time to adapt Arnold Bennett's old wives tale. And I did that as half hours. Then I did it as, as two 90 minutes and then as three one hours and, all, all that and 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 of course it changes each time you do it but it's 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 slightly annoying I mean because I haven't done anything for for a while I'm sure it still goes on but I'm talking about you know 20 years ago or so I think every writer I've ever talked to who writes for TV has that had that experience of having to refashion if they've got even to the script stage um, of having to refashion uh, it does sound rather soul-destroying actually it's not great. It isn't great. It is a bit, a tiny bit soul destroying, but you have to be resilient. And I think that, you know, to write scripts, you do have to be a, a certain sort of person. You, you have to be resilient and you can be as precious as you like as a novelist. You could not want any words changed. I mean, Iris Murdoch refused to have any words changed in her novels. You can, because this is your private world that you've created and, um, it's a completely different process but if you're a screenwriter you have to, you have to foster a character of being one of a team and adaptable and to listen to other people because you are their servant they they're they're doing the investment you're your hard hand um however much it's your original project you're a hard hand and you have you have um you can't be too precious about it. And that, as I said, might be one of the reasons that people don't often like novelists adapting their own work in case they are too precious to change anything. As I said, I usually was the opposite. Quite often producers would say to me, oh, Debbie, I wish you I wish you kept that bit in. I love that bit in your book. And I would have got rid of it. Um, because as we all know, you know, screenwriting is rewriting. And each time you rewrite it, you're killing your darlings. And that is the person you are. And you have to be resilient and of course you you should stand up for your corner if 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 you really care about something and feel very strongly but um you should listen to people and as i said a good script meeting is a wondrous thing i mean a bad one is ghastly but a good one is a wondrous thing because you're talking about work and i envy people who go to you know work in writers rooms which maybe some people do who are in our chat room because it must be delirious to, to have all these ideas flying around and, and, and kind of jokey and fun because it's a bit lonely being a writer. Um, not quite as lonely being a screenwriter as being a novelist where it can be very isolating. Um. So Tulip Fever, 
um, had a very long road to the screen. Um, first optioned, I think, in 1999, almost made in 2004, finally released in 2017 with a completely different team than was on board in, almost completely different team than was on board in 04. During that journey, there were drafts of the script written by Lee Hall, Christopher Hampton, Tom Stoppard, and you. Um, so where did you fit into that picture? And how did the script change over that time? Because that is the most ludicrously high profile bunch of writers you could possibly imagine on one project. Well, we also had your lovely Maura Buffini, who you did recently on, on this podcast. She did a fantastic draft. She did one of the very best drafts, actually. I, I'm a huge admirer of hers. Um, Christopher Hampton's was really good. It was a little bit dry, but it was really good. Um, what happened? Oh, it was, it, it was, I mean, it's not as ghastly as compared to ghastly, ghastly, but it was ghastly in screenwriting terms because I, I wrote this novel, Tulip Fever, and the minute I wrote it, um, it's, it's set, for those of you who don't know, it, it's set in um, 17th century Amsterdam, Vermeer's time. And it's about how people, it's a love affair, a love triangle with an older merchant, his young wife, and a handsome young painter who comes to paint their portrait, falls in love with the young wife. And they, they gamble on tulip bulbs to make enough money to elope. And tulip bulb gambling was the most extraordinary phenomenon at that period, which 1636, where the whole country went completely barking mad gambling on tulip bulbs, huge fortunes were made and lost. They were gambling on what color the bloom would be, whether it would be a striped bloom or not, what they called a broken bloom when it came out. And um, it was, I wrote the novel in a great rush of love for Dutch painting and sort of Vermeer paintings, you know, where, where you've got, where those paintings are like film stills actually, because you've got, they're very narrative driven paintings. You've got the woman playing the virginal, the man with the glass of wine turning around to look at her, the maid pausing with her broom, and you feel you've just come into a, um, a situation which has just paused for a moment, and if you blink, they're going to move off into the rooms and the story is going to continue. And what I did, very cunningly, as it turned out, I didn't mean it to be cunning, was when I wrote the manuscript, I photocopied some Dutch paintings and stuck them in the manuscript, um, because I just love the paintings, and I thought, why not illustrate it? And the everybody and their dog wanted to direct this film the the all the top directors from Ridley Scott to Anthony Minghella to blah, 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 they all they all want to do it because the book if you read the book it is a film it's it's Roger Michel who wanted to do it lovely Roger Michel lately died on he said that I could do the whole film in Dutch and we would get what it was about. We would get the story because it's a very, very visual, strong story and, um, and a big fat romance and, and very atmospheric and things and, um, and very plotty, very, very plotty with big twists and turns. Um, so what happened was Harvey Weinstein wanted for Miramax. They all wanted it. But um, the night that we were going to sign the deal with Miramax, Steven Spielberg phoned from his car to Alison Owen, who was the producer, and um, said, I want this movie. I, I think this, I've never read a book that is, you know, blah, all that stuff. So we dumped Weinstein and went with Spielberg. And I flew out to, um, this is like two weeks after the manuscript was finished. I mean, amazing. And I flew out to Hollywood with um, uh, uh, Alison Owen and, um, and within, you know, a couple of days, there we were sitting with Spielberg, having this meeting. And um, the interesting thing about it was that Spielberg, although he was incredibly laid back and really nice, and it was all Navajo rugs and ochre walls and, very, and cappuccinos and very, very casual, he was still the kingpin. And in the studio system, you know, the, the, everyone bows to the king. And at one point in the meeting, he said, off the top of his head, he said, I think this is a comedy about, uh, I think this is a comedy about poverty. Um, and if you've read the book, it's not particularly funny and it's not particularly about poverty. It's about a whole lot of stuff, but not particularly those things. And the producer that was going to work on the film did what happens in Hollywood a lot. He didn't process or analyze whether that was accurate and truthful to the book and the, and the possible film. He took what the, the boss said. And so I went off to write it, but every note that I got 
was bring out the comedy, bring out the poverty. The, 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 he was quite low down in the, in the pecking order at, at DreamWorks, it turned out, and um, wasn't particularly good. Anyway, so I wrote drafts and things, and maybe two or three drafts I've forgotten. Then they bumped me off and they got this, as Alice was saying, this raft of writers, because nobody was really sure, everyone had different ideas about it because we weren't well uh, guided at all because we had this sort of fourth rate producer in. Um, so everyone and their dog, as I said, had a bash at it. Maura Buffini's was, I thought, the best. Lee Hall, I mean, all sorts of people. And Tom Stoppard did one. And, um, and then it was just about to be made into a film. 48, this is 20 years ago, $48 million film, the big British film of the year. The tanks had been sunk to make the canals of Amsterdam. Huge set, half of Kent had been dug up to become the set. Um, all the costumes had been done. Hundreds and hundreds of talented people had been, had been engaged. People had, had you know, put down down payments on flats because they thought they were going to make a lot of money. All that stuff. It's huge. When the week before it was about to shoot, Gordon Brown, who was then chancellor, closed a tax loophole, one of the many tax incentives, whatever they, this was, and the whole film was demolished. And I remember it was destroyed overnight. And other smaller British films um, managed to pick up, pick themselves up and go to the Isle of Man. I remember a film called The Libertine went off to the Isle of Man overnight and shot there. Um, but we were a great oil tanker, we couldn't turn around. And so all those jobs were lost and all that talent. And I remember, I remember a nursery in Thames Ditton phoning up and saying, we've got 12,000 tulip plants here, you know, all in their little pots. What are you going to do with them? And so I said, well, dump 600 in my front garden and I'll give them to the neighbours. And Tracy Chevalier, whose girl with a pearl earring, was also going to difficulties at this time. She lived nearby, so she came and took some. And every spring, my little film would pop up in people's front gardens, little tulips. That was the only grace note in this ghastly thing. But anyway, years passed. I thought it was all dead. And then our saviour rode out of the sunset um, on his white charger, and it was bloody Harvey Weinstein, out of the frying pan, into the fire. Didn't know that then, of course. All that I knew was that he was very dogmatic and bossy, but that he'd made some amazing films. And it was more his sort of film, more a Miramax film than a DreamWorks than a Spielberg film anyway. So, you know, everything comes to him who waits. So he did it anyway. So he got it together again. And the script then was mine and Stoppard's. We had joint credit. And um, it was it was made, but by that time, the the backbone of the plot had been broken, and this is the this is the cautionary tale that if you have that many people and that many voices, and each of those voices wants to make their voice heard, the different producers who've come on board, the wines in the whoever, um, you will have probably the backbone or all the little bones of your of your beautiful plot um, broken up because you've had so many different voices and some people want to make it funny and some people want to... Uh, so the film was made with Alicia Vikander and Dane DeHaan, Judy Dench is in it. Um, it has some amazing actors, um, but it didn't entirely make any sense. Um, and um, it, it's, it's, it, it had a very mixed reception in, in Hollywood and, and oh, I, anyway, it, 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 it sort of, it looked very beautiful but some of the performances didn't quite work and it didn't make sense because I don't think the actors knew what was actually quite happening because the plot had been mucked up so much. And um, it was almost unrecognizable from the book. Um, I mean, it wasn't unrecognizable, but, but the, the important hinges were not there. And so it came out and um, almost that week, uh, the whole sex scandal blew up the Weinstein company imploded overnight um, and dis disintegrated. And this film, this disaster movie that had taken 100, 100 billion years to happen, um, died overnight and didn't, it went to cinemas for like two days, as far as I know. Um, so what I did um, was I decided, because it never had a premiere, I decided I'll make my own premiere. So I hired a cinema in Belsize Park in London. I hired the screen on, on the hill got in some drinks, got 140 friends or however much would fill a cinema there, and 
had a premiere of the film and me and one of the extras, because I'm always an extra in my own films, me and one of the extras who, who not only was just a lowly extra, but his part had been cut. Um, a very sporting chap called Terry Nunn. Um, we went on stage and introduced the film and we raised our glasses because none of the stars were there, of course. We raised our glasses to all the people, all the unseen people who are so talented and who make our movies, the, the props, the, the, the costume people, all that stuff, the extras. Um, and we had this wonderful evening. So it was sort of, it, you know, it was kind of fun, but it was also kind of awful. Um, and they're worse things than having your film not made, but it was ghastly. And the whole Harvey Weinstein thing sort of tainted it anyway. There's a book, that's the whole book in and of itself. That's absolutely fantastic. Um, <laughs> thank you for that. Um, funnily enough, in the course of that, you, you, you sort of touched on something else I, I was going to ask about. Um, you mentioned that it is, quite, it is quite plotty. And watching it last night, I hadn't seen it before. I watched it on DVD last night. Um, I think that above all stands out. It's a very fast film. There's a lot of short scenes because it's trying to encompass an awful lot of story. Um, yeah. And watching it, I did wonder whether if you were doing it now, not you particularly, but if one were adapting it now, perhaps TV would be a more natural home for it, three parts or more, simply to encompass the amount of story you've got to tell. Absolutely. And, and it has, you know, big humongous plot twists which would be good for the end of episodes and things um that that would be great i mean i took a cue when i was writing the screenplay from uh alison owen the producer's own elizabeth her film elizabeth which if if you remember if you saw it it's very atmospheric and dank um a lot of um period drama gets too cleaned up um because as you know the screen cleans everything and you, you try to make a messy room and it sort of cleans it up in some indefinable way. And a lot of um, uh, period movies, I think, look too stage setting and clean and too well lit. And something that Alice Nowen did with, um, uh, uh, Kapoor did, did with um, Elizabeth and which lovely Roger Michelle, back to Roger Michelle, did with Persuasion um, is a period drama where it looks it looks as if somebody's always, as if they're half walking out of the frame all the time. There are people in the rooms. You can smell the sort of dankness of the canal in Amsterdam or wherever. Um, yeah, it feels much more socially realist than, than um, a lot of period dramas. And that's what we wanted for Tulip Fever and what we certainly wanted for Pride and Prejudice, which I think Joe Wright, the director, got incredibly well with Pride and Prejudice because I said to him let's make this the wet the muddy hem version he thought I said muddy hens but it was muddy hem the same you know that that cast of girls in Pride and Prejudice should wear the same dresses every day they're on their uppers they should have mud at the bottom because they're going on these walks they should have no makeup they should be as young as they as they are in the book um, and let's make us really feel there's a muddy world out there, a cold world which has no welfare state and if one of those girls doesn't get married well that family is going to slip into poverty and those girls into dependency and the humour can come from the, the sort of desperation of that. And Comedy about poverty in fact. What? Comedy about poverty in fact. Yes, actually yes, he was quite right that producer after all, at last. He was Wrong right. project though. <laughs> Wrong project. Um, so, in a, you 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 described earlier about um, the feeling that uh, having someone else adapting your work can feel a bit like um, you know rifling through your underwear drawer. Um, Best Exotic Marigold Hotel did turn out very well. Um, I, I thought so. It's a very enjoyable movie. But do you think would you now option a book of yours if you weren't guaranteed to be the only screenwriter on it? I would like to do it myself. Yeah, yeah. And I don't mind being bumped off because, as I said, you have to be resilient and not take it personally. Because, I mean, I've been bumped off things and been hauled back again and people are very apologetic. But I don't I don't care. You know, I say, well, that's fine. You you were stupid to bump me off and now you're as clever to get me back on. <laughs> so, um, no, I'd rather do it myself. But um, I'm trying to think. 
I mean, I have adapted several of my books since then, but they haven't happened. Um, and it's, as I said, quite a schizophrenic, if I can use that word, it's not the right word, but it's quite a split thing to do, but it's enjoyable. And to revisit the book, you're, um, as, as I said, you're, you can work out problems, maybe on screen, which foxed you when you were doing the book. So you do it as long as you had a chance to have first crack at it. What they do yeah. with it after that yeah. is up to them. It's fair, I'd, right? I'd, I'd like to have first crack of it. Um, and, in, and if they don't think it's such up to snuff, absolutely fine. Get somebody else in to do it and they may easily do it better. Um, so I'm going to come to questions in a sec. Um, if you have any, if you have any questions, do, um, do pop them in the, in the chat. Um, uh, a handful of people submitted questions in advance, um, most of which I think we've already covered. Um, but there was one I wanted to ask you specifically, because um, I thought it was quite interesting. Um, how can we have a more diverse choice of books to be adapted for the screen? Um, the example that the person gave was British Chinese stories are currently absent. Now, my reflection on that is uh, actually on the whole, it's producers and broadcasters rather than screenwriters who choose what projects are made. But do you think that new versions of say Austin or Dickens or Hardy are sometimes commissioned as safe options at the expense of adaptations of more modern, less canonical works and therefore at the expense of you know, a sense of diversity? Absolutely, totally. And I'm sure everybody in this chat room would agree um, that they go back. I mean, they're doing another Pride and Prejudice. They're probably doing one now. I mean, I think there is another one coming out. And I did Nancy Mitford's Love in a Cold Climate, which was bliss actually to do. But then there was another one, the Emily Walty one, Mortimer one. Um, they go back to those because it, at times of dodginess um, and financial, financial dodginess, they go back to the tried and tested things. And you can see why. And of course, the, the, the solution to that is to have colorblind casting, do a Bridgerton on Pride and Prejudice or whatever. Um, but no, absolutely right. I've been, funny enough, I've been having this very conversation because um, I'm making the best exotic Marigold Hotel into a stage play, nothing to do with the film. It's from my book, but um, I've had a conversation with the, producer and director about whether the British cast in the best exotic marigold hotel for those who don't know old old age pensioners in Britain outsource themselves to a rackety old hotel in India um, to retire to and it's all about whether India living time for another adventure and India changing one and the magic of you know having another life when people think you're past it and all that um, and one of the conversations was about whether the British cast should be more ethnically diverse um, because we just are. Um, and, but you see that made it was really difficult because the point of it, the point of the story is Brits going to India about which they, they might have mixed feelings or they might be trepidation or whatever. It's about East and West and it's about the British people coming to terms with India and the Indi English people, the Indian people coming to terms with Britain. It's, it's, it's a culture clash film. So they really do have to be white in this case. Um, because if, if, if you somebody suggested one of the characters was a Sri Lankan nurse, retired nurse, that's fine. But how are you going to on stage make it clear that you've got this culture clash going on? So it was just, that, that's a, a, a sort of slightly tangential to you to your to the question but uh, we I think that it's going to happen that that, that these di books from diverse writers are going to are going to be done because there's a huge influx um in this last year or so of 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 multicultural books I mean diverse novels and some of them have been huge hits some of them would make wonderful um, telly or films and you've got production companies who are who are the more adventurous ones who are not going back to Pride and Prejudice and things, who will want to reflect what's happening now. And maybe they may be from other countries themselves, who knows? So I think that that will feed through. Let's hope that that will feed through and we will see that sort of representation of what the world is like um, more. We, we, we've seen it a certain amount on our television at the moment, which, which has been really interesting and taking people by surprise by the success thinking of Martina Cole obviously and all sorts of other programs 
Um, so a uh, question from Nick, this loops back to the, my first question actually about um, to have and to hold. Um, do you have any advice for someone adapting their screenplay into a novel? And that is actually, a, a, that's a good question. I've considered it myself from time to time. Um, uh, Cause you know, you have, say you have total control over it. Your screenplay may not have been made. If you write it as a novel, at least people will read it. Whereas screenplays, they may not be read by that many people. So any sort of key things that you might draw out of, of that advice you might give on that? Well, if it does help if something has been a novel already, I think we all know that because it's got somebody has believed in it enough to invest in it as a novel and it's had a life as a novel and that's given it a certain credibility. So that, but, but putting that aside, I think that adapting your own stuff, you do the same thing. You have the same detachment as you would being offered, you know, the Diary of Anne Frank or Pride and Prejudice or Love in a Cold Climate, three things I were offered, or Anne Fine's Goggle Eyes, which was something I did. Um, you, you come at it cold, even if it's your book. Um, it's very important to, to put the book aside, even, say if you've just finished writing it or whatever, you know, put it aside, Go, go away, don't look at it for several weeks or as long as you can and come to it cold and try and read it as a stranger um, so that you can start to plan out the bullet points of, of the, and the plot twists and the things that you would change. I mean, when I when I uh, adapt a book, um, that probably came out in our in our interview, Alistair, when, when in your book, I can't remember, but um, I, I, I read it through and then I will, I'll sometimes mark it up or something, you know, um, Andrew Davis famously says, you know, he just nicked huge chunks of Jane Austen and, and you know, she is a wonderful writer. But um, you then do a rough, you, you do a first draft, which might be very similar to the book. And then what I do is I literally, I practically literally throw the book away because what, when I was talking about a sea change, which is what we're all, sort of involved in in our in, in our work as screenwriters is that that sea change starts from the end of the first draft that's when you're really cooking that's when you're really working um it's so it then becomes a creature of drama and the screen rather than a creature of the of the interior world of um uh the novel i mean I'll give you an example of um, which uh, happened in Pride and Prejudice, where in um, in the book and in the film, um, we have uh, uh, Elizabeth Bennet bumping into Darcy at Pemberley right near the end. And they have a really, really boring conversation. They say, oh, you know, because they're English, they're polite. They say, you know, oh, I fancy meeting you. I'm, I'm, I'm on holiday with my uncle and aunt and Darcy said are you having a pleasant trip and she said yes you know we were we went to Macclesfield and Buxton yesterday I mean so boring I can hardly tell you but the wonderful thing is that the actors by their performance are supplying the novel the world of the novel the interior world of the novel and what their faces are telling us because a good screen actor it's to do with reacting as much as acting it's to do with what they don't say as much as what they say. What they say is boring in this case because they're English, as I said. Their faces are telling us, I can't bear it. I completely misjudged you, Mr. Darcy or, and Elizabeth Bennet. I thought that you were terribly proud and snotty. I realized actually you were trying to protect your sister. Uh, I, I love you more than I can say. I can hardly bear to look at you. We could be so happy here, but it's never gonna happen. That, that, that world of the novel, which is so, which is the, 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 the whole story, that the subterranean story, that is in the performances. And the performers may be saying something um, seemingly not relevant or dull or whatever it might be, but that's the subtext because screenwriting is all about subtext. And it was lovely watching that scene and seeing what Matthew McFadden and Kieran Knightley did, did with that very banal British buttoned up conversation. So adapting a novel is taking that interior world of the screenplay where you know everyone's hopes and dreams and their childhoods and a whole lot of stuff you know 
from the in the novel when you read it because you read it but in the screenplay because it's narrative driven and performance driven it has to come out of the performances and you have to uh, have as strong a subtext as possible as you write because you've got to leave the actors to do their job that's what they're paid for and that's what they're good at um, and the more the more the director understands that if somebody's talking about you know the, their friend's baby and somebody's just had an abortion you know the director will know that sitting around that table the person who's had the abortion is the person who's going to be reacting and that's where the camera should be and your screenplay will somehow um, identify this that's actually, uh, that's good. That's, that's, a, that's an answer to someone else's question entirely, which is what's Deborah's starting point for adapting a novel to the screen. Um, in terms of the original question, which is adapting a screenplay back into a novel, how would you approach, what would be your, what would be your advice for approaching that? Um, if it's somebody else's screenplay or your own screenplay. Your own. Your own. Um, I think the, the secret to that is to go away for a few months. Uh, from the book, I mean, not physically go away, stick, stick your screenplay somewhere else. Um, if possible, not watch it perhaps, but you probably will because you might be on television or something. But anyway, um, detach yourself from enough and rethink it profoundly. Rethink it in the profound way one, one creates a novel um, and not be, uh, Try to release yourself from, from the screenplay and rethink scenes and rethink yourself. You know, don't go by what you've seen the actors doing, but think what does this woman or this man really think during this scene? What are they going through? Because you're doing a different creature. You're, you're making a novel. And the one that I did to have to hold, I didn't have time to do that. Um, I was busy having to earn money and bring up children. And, things stuff that we have to do obviously um but i, think it, actually, I should drawing, have been longer drawing out from from this from this conversation the sort of key points a lot of it comes back to actually detachment and rethinking it's about yeah. objectivity isn't it absolutely absolutely and you can you can sort of learn that and learn to be Ruth, perhaps what i haven't said is learn to be ruthless with yourself actually i did say sort of kill your darlings um because with screenplay writing, more than no with novel writing, you can be quite indulgent. You can put a whole lot in. You still have to know the, 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 the shape and the trajectory of the story and know what, I mean, in my case, know what happens at the end because the end will inform everything that happens in the novel. But um, you can, you've got room for, room for messing around. But with a screenplay, if you're not ruthless, they're going to be ruthless so it's going to end on the cutting room floor even if they make it um which they you know they may cut it out long before that so that's what i mean by having the temperament um as a screenplay writer to be ruthless with your own work um but also st stick up for it as i said if 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 you really feel things and if, if you feel they haven't got they haven't got it right because they, you know that they're only human like you are um, I'm just going to have a couple more questions. There's quite a long one here um, from uh, George Harold Millman, um, which I'll come back to in a sec. Um, one from Linda Walton. Um, did, uh, did you study screenwriting techniques before venturing into adapting your work? Uh, if so, where? I don't think you did, did you? Self-taught? No, but I'll tell you the best, best thing I did, and I do sometimes. Uh, I know I didn't study it anywhere. Um, I sort of went straight in. In those days, you sort of could. I mean, probably you still can. I don't. Um, if you're lucky. I, I was lucky, I think. Um, what, I, what I did, which I think is the best tip I would give anyone, is I would take a really good movie with a really great screenplay, like Pinter's screenplay for The Go-Between, Emma Thompson's screenplay for Sense and Sensibility. She's a wonderful writer and she's got Jane Austen in her bone marrow. Um, she did some bits of Pride and Prejudice, I think. I didn't even know. Um, uh, Shortcuts, the Robert Altman film that he wrote with Frank Barheit from uh, the Raymond Carver short stories. I think one of the great films. Anyway, this is, in other words, films that are based on books. Watch the movie, 
download the screenplay, which you can do with most of them um, for nothing, and read the book in whatever order and see what really great screenplay writers do with the book to turn them into a screenplay. And you just learn so much. You learn a huge, huge amount. And just, and I would also suggest just read screenplays so that you get familiar with the vocabulary and it doesn't spook you. And also it's quite cheering because you find they're full of typos, people's names change, God knows what. You learn that a screenplay should, it's a selling document and it should be fun to read. And Andrew Davis is, a, is apparently a past master at this. And, you know, in Vanity Fair, he'll just put a stage directions. Betty Sharp thinks, fuck it. You know, things like that. It's kind of, it gets it and it's fun. Um, I remember reading the screenplay, wonderful screenplay of uh, Thelma and Louise, Carrie Curry's Oscar winning screenplay. And about the Gina Davis character's husband in the screenplay, she just writes, polyester was made for this man. And it's great. It's fun to read. The actor will so get it. The producer, the people who are going to actually, you know, bankroll it, will so get it. Um, and even quite uh, well-known screenwriters can bog their screenplays down in too much detail, or they're not fun to read, or they don't have light and shade, or they don't whiz along. And so the screenplay itself should be fun entertaining let's say rather than fun fun uh, entertaining to 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 read what was the question i've gone all over the place i think you pretty much answered it i pretty well answered it <laughs> <laughs> um yeah. so uh george um we don't have time to to look at this um uh if you i would like to address it though because it's a really interesting question um and i might be able to um answer it from my own side if you want to drop me an email via the contact page of my website and i will give some thought to that because I'd like to um, I'd like to address that question properly, Debbie. I have one final question before I uh, before we uh, wrap up, um, uh, which uh, in fact Nadine asked uh, before we uh, came online this evening, which is, how have you found it writing during lockdown or during the pandemic? It's been such a weird time, and it's a question I've been asking the, the interviewees. And obviously, I've had a particular experience. I'm interested know you know what it's been like for you yeah i i have found it really difficult and and as we were saying before we sort of came on air so to speak um nobody's going to lose any sleep over writers not being able to work really but it's i've been overwhelmed by a feeling of panic and sort of overwhelming sorrow um a, a sort of feeling of fluster and discombobulation and yet paralysis um, and not knowing what the future is going to hold, having this harumphing elephant in the room, this vast elephant in the room that I wouldn't know how to tackle with if I was writing about it, which I don't think anyone wants to hear about anyway, and we're not distant enough from it to know how to cope with it. Um, it's bulldozed through our lives, emotionally, creatively, physically, everything, Ely. Um, and it's been difficult. I did finish a novel in the first lockdown um, because I've, the first lockdown I found, like a lot of people, much easier than the next two. Um, when we all banged our saucepans and it was spring and things. Um, and I did bring in the pandemic at the end of the novel. It's a novel called The Black Dress, which has just come out. And it ends with lockdown because I thought a lot of people are going to be locked down with people they don't choose to be or complicated things. So I just ended it just to nod to the pandemic because I couldn't possibly tackle it. But um, that's by the by, you know, how much is going to feature in people's work. Nobody yet knows. Um, I, it, 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 it was difficult it, it was not great but some writers I know they said rather smugly oh didn't make any difference to me I have my characters to keep me company isn't it annoying when people say that um and it's the same as it always was I sit in a room and I write you know um so it didn't affect me much which I thought was an extraordinary thing saying it didn't affect you much because I think it's affected everyone if it hasn't affected you keep quiet about it because you've been very <laughs> No, it's like having hemorrhoids or something. You know, if you've got hemorrhoids, don't go on about it. If you, the pandemic didn't affect you, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a fantastic note to end on. Thank you very much, Debbie. Um, 
So if you want to hear more uh, from, from Debbie, she's one of 12 terrific screenwriters in the art of screen adaptation. I would say that, of course. Um, uh, and right now there's 25% off the book if you order via the Creative Essentials website and quote voucher code CE25 at the checkout. Um, you'll find links to their website on my Twitter bio, which is at Alistair Writer, and also on my website, uh, alistairandwriter.com. Um, this interview will be available on the Writers Guild YouTube channel. Uh, along with my previous Q&As with Sarah Phelps, Christopher Hampton, Lucinda Coxon, David Nichols, Moira Buffini, and former Guild President Olivia Hetreed, where she turned the tables and interviewed me. Um, and the previous interviews in this series, before we had the bright idea of partnering with the lovely people at the Guild, uh, can also be accessed via my website, Q&As with Jeremy Brock and Hossein Amini. So finally, as ever, uh, a big thank you to the Guild for hosting this event. Um, a bigger thank you to all of you for watching. Uh, and the biggest thank you to Debbie for taking the time to talk to us. Debbie, thank, thank you very you. much.